Welcome to Real Life Renos, the podcast. This is part two of our conversation with Robert Lipka, who is currently a principal urban designer with the city of Edmonton. Also joining in the conversation is Ron Wickman, an architect who specializes in barrier-free design. Our conversation focused on small towns and the challenges of becoming accessible when century buildings weren't built with accessibility, much less universal design in mind. Speaking of universal design, later on in the podcast, we chatted about words and how much they matter. Welcome back, and it's good to have Ron Wickman with us again. And of course, Robert Lipka has joined us, as promised in the last podcast. We're going to take a look in this podcast at urban development and the plight that many small towns are finding themselves in, where, um, you know, they have these centuries-old buildings that really aren't accessible. They've got narrow sidewalks. There's no place to park, certainly not for an accessible vehicle. How do we solve all of this, Robert? We're, we're looking to people like you to, to solve these problems for us. Well, that's, that's a, well, I can go on for hours for that one, Karen, but I'll, I'll try to make it short and sweet. But I, I think, you know, from a rural perspective, um, you know, uh, as we were talking about um, a while back, um, you know, even though I grew up in downtown Toronto, I grew up in a village. Like uh, the, the area is called Bloordale. For those who know, know Toronto, it's just north of Parkdale, which is more uh, famous for some good and bad reasons <laughs> in Toronto from a prime perspective. But anyway, um, yeah, the community where I grew up in, all of my schools were, were that I went from you know zero to to uh, finishing high school uh, were within five minute walk from my house. Uh, all the shopping, all the food stores, all the clothing stores, everything you wanted was in five minute walk. So, uh, you know, we beat the whole 15 minute city thing. We had a five minute city where I grew up in. So that's used to be the beauty of small towns, right? If you drive throughout, uh, especially in Ontario where you are, cause I'm from Ontario, so I know, but also in, even in um, smaller towns in, in Alberta as well, which I've been to a number of them so far, haven't seen them all yet. Um, but, you know, they do have a center, right? They have a heart. They have, you know, usually there's the community center, there's the legion, um, there are other, you know, kind of draws uh, to get into the village. But unfortunately over time, you know, developers have come in, looked at, or, you know, redeveloping um, uh, farmland uh, further out from the village center to build, you know, big box retail, right? So you're getting your Walmarts, your your superstores, your et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so unfortunately, over time, you know, a lot of the smaller shops that used to be in these uh, village centers are slowly died. Um, and there's not much to replace them, unfortunately. And and so you're having people who are basically living in their car, uh, driving everywhere uh, to get anything uh, if they live in a, in a rural community. Um, and so that just makes it more difficult. Uh, you raised a good point about a lot of the older buildings in these uh, older villages and smaller, you know, hamlets and towns uh, weren't accessible. Uh, but to me, the answer is not, you know, building massive Walmarts further out so that people have to drive to them. Because sometimes those aren't, even though, you know, they're just a big flat, um, you know, shop, uh, sometimes the parking lots aren't very well designed from an accessibility perspective. Uh, I'm sure Ron can tell you stories about that. Um, and, and so, um, you know, the, the, you know, the concept of trying to make the uh, existing hamlet or the village center more accessible is possible. Um, it's obviously going to take some time. Um, but, you know, redeveloping some of these older buildings, uh, you could put ramps on them um, at the front or at the side of the building or even at the rear because a lot of them have rear alley access. Um, so if you make improve the alleyways, um, the rear alleys, then you could make them more accessible. Um, you have people repurposing some of these old kind of you know, older, smaller kind of factory buildings that are all one level. So that's perfect. Um, you could do something amazing with those buildings as well in some of the smaller communities. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities up there um, to definitely make these smaller towns uh, more accessible. Ron, what say you? Well, it, um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, I, I you know I was thinking uh, back to when I started my my own practice. So that was 1995, and um, at the time, I I honestly didn't know or think that other architects uh, didn't know what I knew about accessibility. So I I just assumed that um, everybody every architect knew a lot about accessibility 
and maybe my edge was that I knew it a little bit better, but you know, uh, I've, I've since discovered that that's not completely true. Um, and I thought as a kind of marketing strategy for myself, I would target small towns. So instead of uh, competing with the, the big firms in Edmonton and uh, for work, I would go into small towns thinking about the fact that uh, the population is aging and uh, thinking, well, you know, they're going to have to make their little uh, city hall uh, more accessible, uh, the shops, everything, restaurants, coffee shops, everything more accessible. Uh, I thought this would be a good opportunity for me to get some work that maybe a lot of the other architects wouldn't really be looking for. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, I ended up learning a lot about marketing myself and and just getting comfortable with talking about what I can provide, services, so on, learning a little bit more about the business of being an architect. But I don't remember ever getting any work. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um Luckily, I, I, you know, picked up some work here and there. I did some house renovations and, and uh, it didn't take long before, you know, word got out that I did have this unique take on, on, uh, on design uh, from, you know, from an accessibility point of view. And then it just kind of slowly um, uh, grew from there. Um, what's interesting is <clears throat> today I'm getting asked more and more now to, uh, by small towns to kind of have a look at things. And, and just in a really uh, interesting uh, twist of fate, my, <clears throat> my son and his wife and family, uh, they started a small craft brewery in Devon, which is uh, about a 30 minute drive from Edmonton, just between Ed Edmonton and, and the, uh, the international airport. <clears throat> it's a small community of about 6,000 people. And uh, they they wanted to create something that had a bit of a community feel, something that people would feel comfortable uh, coming and and joining in on, uh, just good gatherings. So although it is a a place where you drink alcohol, craft beer is way too expensive to uh, <laughs> to to have too many um, before you 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 break your budget. So it's just a good place for people to socialize. The the, the my kids have have worked really hard to have like events like trivia night and and uh, they have uh, artists and singers coming. Um, and it's just become a bit of a hub. And it's been really interesting watching that from my point of view, uh, seeing how. A, a small business can can really um, uh, get people to gather and bring people together. And uh, certainly one thing from my point of view in, in helping them out was to make sure the space was super accessible. So they're very accommodating to, to people with different uh, disabilities, uh, certainly accessible bathrooms and so on. And we've got some visual aids, some, some um, uh, we've got a hearing loop at the front counter for people who use hearing aids and so on. So um, I'm, I'm kind of now sort of slowly investing some of my own time and spirit into what could Devon look like? It's a, it's a place where people can bike to from Edmonton within 20 minutes or so, or half an hour maybe. So it's almost as quick to get to Devon by bicycle as it is by car. So and, just to get back to the building yeah, for yeah. a second, Ron, was it an existing building? Or a yeah, building. yeah. So it's just off the the center street uh, where there's a, a bunch of your older buildings, and it's a right. it is a strip it is a, a space within a strip mall. So it already has uh, um, kind of the on grade access. Um, so but you they didn't had have to, to do, do much in terms of entrance, and so no, it was it no, was inside. That's right. Yeah, and then um, they were looking at one point on on the main street. Uh, but they're so close to the main street and, you know, as it turns out, they've got this big parking lot just outside their, their space. So in the summer they were able to, they've, they've been open less than a year. So in the summer when they opened, they were able to take over a bunch of parking stalls and have an outdoor patio area. And what, what's also interesting is that the, the, uh, the Devon council, uh, the decision makers in Devon, were very much in favor of this. So they've done everything to support this small business to to invest in their community. So there's probably uh, um, a, a more interest from small cities to 
to get some of this stuff done because they do want to create a a nice little place for um, for residents and they, and they do recognize that the the residents of rural uh, Alberta are are generally aging right so more so than even in in cities so so I agree totally with Robert that we should. Um, somehow fight the uh, the big box stores from infiltrating these small towns and create a a town that is uh, more conducive to p- pedestrians and people on bikes and and so on. Um, but economics, you know, that it's that's a it's the double edged sword. It's a, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. I, I was asked. I was just thinking about it when you were talking, Ron. I was asked to go to speak to a group in Lacombe. Um, the the city um, planners and the mayor actually is really keen. And that's what's a great thing about the smaller towns is they can actually make things make make change happen quicker, right? As you alluded to, and and um, I gave them I provided a, a presentation on accessibility, and they showed me some of the shops that are really keen along the their main street to be more accessible. And I showed them some imagery of ramps that they could put in. Uh, making sure that you know that obviously they can actually safely access the you know the the shop, but also that they a lot of ramps that when stores put them in they can be quite dangerous for somebody with low vision because they're hard to see sometimes, right? So making sure they have proper barriers around them and maybe they're a brighter color so they stand out a bit more. Um, this would be a lot harder to deliver in a in a large city like you know we're in Edmonton where, where I am, but in a smaller town you could start rolling some of these things out right you could put in mm-hmm. ramps in, in particular places um, and they could I suggested to them as a more longer term goal is to actually look at widening um, maybe not necessarily widening their entire sidewalk because that's costly but what they could do is actually take one of the parking lanes or the driving lanes out um, they have two uh, they could make it a one-way street um, their main street and actually push out the parking to the next lane out and then that old parking lane could be a a lane where uh, basically pedestrians could use so you just have ramps on either end of it and uh people on mobility chair will you know uh, wheelchairs etc could actually access um that space because it's nice and flat and um you know it's it's uh, pretty smooth and uh, very accessible so that's something they can consider uh, further on down the line um, and small towns can do that because they can do it a heck of a lot quicker um, mm-hmm. you'll see that if you go to some or small some other small towns in alberta they're implementing tactile walking surface indicators the the twizzies the little yellow dots at, at intersections they're putting them in uh, on their main streets it's incredible uh, mm-hmm. whereas we're still struggling to do that in edmonton yeah so yeah, in edmonton true. you have a design uh, guideline and that is something that a lot of big cities have some smaller counties and so forth do as well but as you have previously noted it really only applies to the municipally owned buildings owned and operated essentially or the ones that are leased out in terms of the older buildings that are owned by the people who run stores in them you're indicating that there is some interest in in accessibility what about the towns that have a large percentage of buildings owned as an investment by somebody in a big city far far away how can they be incentivized is there anything that is being done with the guidelines that edmonton has as a for instance that could be duplicated elsewhere but then how do you incentivize these um owners who aren't there very much. maybe they go once a year or something but they do yeah. everything else remotely and they just are interested in renting it out and having the investment how do you incentivize them to help their tenants become more accessible yeah that's definitely more difficult i guess there's there's two i guess there's um two separate questions there the first one with respect to some sort of guideline or standard document actually ron mentioned that both of uh, myself and i uh, and him sit on the safety codes council of alberta um, which has the uh, barrier free design guide so the barrier free design guide applies all across the province so any of these small towns could use that document um, for their benefit right so it's like similar to what 
we have uh, the city of Edmonton created the access design guide um, separately. I tried to bring the two together, uh, but the city was really adamant about creating its own document because there are some things in the barrier free design guide that are, are, you know, don't, aren't covered uh, for the city of Edmonton, i.e. LRT, uh, right? So not every city has uh, light rapid transit um, uh, or even a bus, you know, a bus system. Uh, and so those are the things that amongst other things that are covered in our access design guide. But quite frankly, the barrier-free design guide uh, for the province of Alberta uh, from the Safety Codes Council is very uh, thorough and it could be very helpful to smaller municipalities. So they could use that to push it in front of developers and say, hey, um, you know, there's, here are some ways that we could redesign uh, the front, uh, you know, access of your building to make it more accessible. Now, the second part of it is trying to encourage people. Um, that's the tougher one, especially if they're if they they're not like as you said, Karen. If they don't live in the in the town where they own the property, that's definitely going to be more difficult. But having worked with a lot of business owners in a previous life, when I used to be a, a consultant before I started working for government. Um, Quite frankly, like I don't understand why a business owner would want to not um, encourage between 25 to 27 percent of the population in Alberta has some form of, of disability that is uh, hindered by the built environment. So basically, you're cutting out 25 percent or more of, of your future customers, right? So to me, that's not good business. So um, you know that's the way I would try to sell it to them and help them by showing these guidelines um, that would make it a little bit easier for them to uh, design. Because as Ron pointed out, there's a lot of architects out there that really need some training. And I know Ron's been doing a heck of a job yeah. trying to upscale people. Um, but yeah, it's amazing how many architects that I deal with on a daily basis or you know, talking about the developments that they're working on. And some of them do have some knowledge of accessibility, which is great. Point them to our access design guide. Like I know they don't have to follow it, but here, have a look. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of architects out there that don't have a clue. Yes. Ron, anything in defense of the architects? <laughs> 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 no, I mean, well, in, 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 in yeah. fairness, in a previous podcast, you said that when you were being uh, educated, the only way that the topic was brought up was when you brought it up. And that's mm -hmm. because you had yeah. a family reference. So yeah. Yeah. again, it goes back to schooling, which we've mentioned so many times. The, the professionals, the trades, they're not taught this stuff in school. Yeah, Ex well, exactly. And it's, it's, it's it's uh, not just the design world, but it you know we talked a bit about people in the general public, the builders, developers. It it you know just it's a topic that's been around for a long time, but it's still not well understood. So it it seems that people really will engage the issue of accessibility when it really hits hits them personally, right? So either themselves or a family member or so on. And so it, it, it is a, it's a tough struggle to, to um, make some of these uh, positive changes for accessibility when people don't understand what truly what the benefits are, right? So we've, we've tried to promote it as something that it's just, you know, morally, it's the right thing to do. And that, you know, that might affect some people, but uh, it, it's... Um, We've tried to say there's economic benefits to it, but until somebody does it and make it, you know, makes it work um, financially uh, in a real positive way, you know, they're kind of waiting for somebody to invest time and money into that to see see how they do. Um, we've tried to make the case that we can make it beautiful and that, that benefits everybody. Certainly, I think the thing that's really gained traction is is the fact that. Um, we can argue that you know, a curb cut is a good example of something that was originally designed for a very specific population of people uh, that now we see the benefits of it, right? So that this thing we call the curb cut effect where we design something that is specific to a, a population um, of people, but then we realize it benefits everybody um, in a really positive way. So there's all of that, but you know, again, I, I guess for me, uh, at this point in my life, what I really feel needs to happen is that we need to develop a, a critical mass of understanding, a critical mass of people that truly understand the issues enough to, 
to uh, move move the needle forward, so to speak, right? So uh, I think in many ways, Robert and I kind of feel like we're in small boats all by ourselves, you know, uh, in amongst all these people that it, they're all working on important things, but um, they just, I don't know, for some reason, they just kind of leave us alone and <laughs> don't, don't always want to listen to us. And, uh, well, and, yeah. and so, yeah, I, I don't know how to, you know, I, I think inevitably time will just allow us to have that happen. But um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm turning 60 this year. So I keep saying like, <laughs> I'm on the wrong side of time now. So, uh, I, I, you know, I want to see some real positive change and I certainly have in my lifetime, but you know, it seems agonizing sometimes how, how slow it, it can, can be. Right. Yeah. I'm with Rod. I just turned 55 not too long ago, so I get it, but it, it's, it's, but it, the, I didn't want to just pick on architects. I, I, I try to, I, I try to pick on everything like in, in my role at the city, um, I have a lot of issues. Um, Ron mentioned uh, curb cuts, right? I deal a lot with engineers. And in my previous uh, job in Auckland, I used to be the only urban designer in a, uh, in a transport agency. And so now I'm kind of using those skills that I learned, um, engineering skills that I learned. I'm not an engineer, but I've, I've worked with engineers for well over 10 years. So I've le- picked up a few things along the way. And curb cut design is, is a perfect example, like Ron pointed out. Obviously, it was specifically designed for people in wheelchairs. But when you come to Edmonton, and when I first arrived here, um, a lot of the curb cuts you'll see have these little grooves in them. And so I asked the engineer, I go, these grooves are just for to get the water off the sidewalk, correct? And he's like, oh, no, well, they help get water off the sidewalk, but they're also good for guiding people with visual impairments. And I said, really? Okay. <laughs> um, so somebody who has a cane, a uh, walking cane using to, gu- to guide themselves if they have low vision or somebody with a guide dog, etc. Uh, when those little grooves in the sidewalk get filled in because we have winter, we have um, uh, sand and salt and other stuff going down on the road, eventually those little grooves get filled up. So how is somebody supposed to detect those little grooves? Uh, oh, well, we cleaned them out. We brushed them out. You know, okay, that's good. Um, and then I, the, the next question I asked them, I said, well, why are all these grooves pointing to the center of the intersection? Because most of the curb cuts are at the top of the uh, curve and they point you to the middle of the intersection. So obviously that's not safe to cross that way. Um, so I asked, asked the gentleman, I said, well, why are they pointing that way then? Are you trying to, you know, get rid of your... A certain population or what's going on here this is interesting um and he didn't really understand what i, I had to describe it and show him what i meant and he kind of turned and looked at me and said oh yeah that's not good um so yeah we don't we're not doing those anymore um and we are putting in the grooves but now we're starting to put in all the newer sidewalks we're actually putting in tactile walking surface indicators mm-hmm. those little yellow domes um so that people can actually um uh, you know, sense where the hazard is, which is the, you know, before they get to the curb cut, no, there's a danger, stop and wait for the traffic light to go or for vehicles to stop if they're at a zebra crossing, and then they can proceed. Um, so yeah, that's just one example of uh, frustrations that I have with engineers as well. So it's not just architects. <laughs> no, but that is a perfect segue to a topic that I do want to discuss because Robert, when you and I were talking earlier, you brought up an expression that really caught my ear, the accessible journey. Can you talk a a bit about that and explain what that is? I'd love to. Uh, When I first moved to New Zealand back in 2006, um, in my work at Auckland Transport, I was lucky enough to meet this lovely lady, Vivian Naylor. Um, She's been in a wheelchair for most of her life. Um, She's a ardent supporter of, of trying to push, um, you know, designers like myself, because um, I was I was pretty uh, young and naive at the time when I first met her um, and didn't understand a lot of these things. And she took me around the city and we were talking about how, you know, it was difficult for her to get around. And she mentioned this whole concept of the accessible journey that had started in New Zealand back in 2005 um, through their, uh, one of their human rights commissions they, they had in the central government um, was to look at trying to cr- create um, a, the accessible journey for everybody. And they have this really uh, interesting images to describe that. And basically what it's saying is, is that I can go from my house 
to visit my friend down the street. I can go, you know, to the shop down down the road. I can get on a bus. I can take the bus to go to my friend's house, or I can go to work. I can come back. I can go to the community center and then get, take another bus or take a LRT or you know whatever, um, however you or, or walk around, and you can get to your house. Um, all of those trips you can do under your own power, right? Because um, in Edmonton, like many cities in Canada, we have a program called DATS. So it's a basically it's a little little mini buses that people, if they're in a wheelchair, mobility scooter, they can call up. Usually, you have to book it two or three days in advance. So if you have a doctor's appointment or you want to go shopping, you book it, and then the bus comes and picks you up from the front of your house and takes you where you got to go. And then um, obviously, you know, you go do your shopping or whatever, and then you have to call for another one that picks you up and takes you home. So there will always be people, um, you know, that will need this kind of service. But my argument is that if Edmonton was more uh, friendly from a you know, built environment perspective, more accessible, that a lot of people who currently use the DAT system wouldn't have to. They'd be able to get on a regular bus, just like everybody else does, get on a the LRT, um, um, Go down to their corner store, the sidewalk, cross the street without having to worry about not having a curb cut on either side, um, making sure there's proper signalized, um, you know, crossings and all that, all that stuff, uh, making sure that it's safe and accessible and they could do all their stuff without having um, to rely on anybody else. So that's in the nutshell, that's the accessible journey. <laughs> Uh, just picking up on something you said, uh, Robert, um, I, I was thinking about uh, a young man I know who I've, I, I've known for quite a long time now. He's, uh, he was just a young boy when I first met him. And he, he, uh, he uses a power wheelchair to get around. And, and uh, we, we were just having a Zoom conversation just like you and I are having. He, he was showing me an app that he uses to, uh, go, to go on journeys um, in and around Edmonton. So he... He lives probably uh, in his wheelchair a good half an hour at least to get from to get from his house to the downtown of Edmonton, and he was showing me how uh, he can he can figure out the right pathway that are all, is all hard surface for him to be able to to get to get to the downtown, and I I you know I just said well you know, hopefully you you go with somebody. <laughs> I, I hate the idea of you like running out of juice in your, your power chair. And he goes, well, you know, I know approximately how long it can run. And, and uh, he goes, no, it's all good. I, some, I sometimes go by myself and I'm like, wow, there's, there's a, a lot of potential danger in that, but he's a, he's a confident young man who, um, who, who has no problems with it. And, and I was frankly quite amazed at, at the, the fact that the technology actually exists. Right. And, um, and, and I was also going to say that uh, I've had a relationship with the University of Alberta for quite a long time now, over 20 years, almost 30 years now, and working with students in industrial design and occupational therapy and, and human ecology, um, all, of those, uh, all of those areas, and just learning about how students um, uh, try to make the world better for people with disabilities, and and uh, the the student mind is fantastic for you know thinking outside the box and being innovative. Um, they're not sort of they haven't been uh, crushed yet by reality and all that sort of stuff. But um, I know that there's been a lot of work lately at using using technology to help. Uh, people with disabilities navigate the, especially the, the university campus and get around there. And uh, the one thing that you and I were just talking about is, is the, the app itself. The technology is only as good as the people that create it. So it's the information that we feed uh, it that will, will get into um, making it better for us to, to be able to get around. So this issue of public washrooms, I remember, uh, probably, I think it was the year 2000, I was at a conference in Montreal. So, that, you know, 20, 24 years ago. And, and there was an hour and a half presentation from a young lady, an industrial designer from England, that was all about public bathrooms. And, and so how hard, how hard it is for seniors to live in the city and get around because they have to um, know where all the public bathrooms are. And when they're downtown, 
you can't just go and use a bathroom in a coffee shop or a washroom or, or sorry, a, a restaurant without being a, like a patron. Right. So basically the gist of her, her presentation was that a lot of people uh, who are older are being kind of held hostage in their homes because they're too afraid to venture out into public uh, be, because of the fear that they just won't be able to find a washroom that they can, they can use. And that was really something, right. That I, you know, well, 20, 24 years ago, I was 24 years younger. So I didn't think, I think about those things today, but I didn't then. But well, I'm with you. Real I'm with reality. you well, I'm with you because like I, public washrooms are a huge passion of mine. And also because not, not because I'm just getting older and I need to, to, to use them more frequently, but also the fact that having lived in a country where like in New Zealand, public washrooms are everywhere. Like it's incredible. And yeah. they're so well designed designed and and when i came back to canada we were walking around when i first moved to edmonton and walking around downtown it was hard to find a public washroom like you said yeah. you had to go into a shop and buy you know buy something and use the facilities and like you mentioned the apps are great um to have but it's it's making sure that the information has been created by somebody who has that you know overarching experience that understands not only people you know who are in wheelchairs mobility scooters but also people with low vision people with dementia you know uh people who are um you know uh maybe ha are you know have a hard of hearing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because, you know, some washrooms might be listed in a particular app saying, oh yeah, this one's really good for somebody in a wheelchair, but somebody with visual impairment might have difficulties using it for a, ver a variety of reasons. And I could go through them uh, another time. But yeah, so it's, it's just making sure that the information has been put together by somebody who has that holistic kind of uh, view. And it might be obviously multiple people involved in developing something like that. The city is trying to improve. The uh, city of Edmonton has uh, recreated the website and we have our public washrooms listed now and they have a bit more detail in them. Um, if any of your listeners want to see the ultimate, go to uh, Australia Public Toilets. I think it's .com. I can send Karen the, um, the, uh, the link. And it has every single public washroom in the country of Australia. Um, and it tells you details of each public washroom and what's in it, what it doesn't have. It'll tell you if it's not accessible, it'll say it's not accessible to such and such, such you know, people who have kind of, uh, you know, mobility challenges they may have. Um, it's incredible. Um, so New Zealand is not up at that level yet, but they do have a pretty good system. Um, and so when we were traveling around with our daughter at the time, when she was very young, it was great because we could find public washrooms everywhere. A big city like Auckland, Wellington, or a small, the smallest town. No problem. That's fantastic. Yeah, if you yeah. would send me that link, then I will put it in our show notes. That'd be just great. Ron, you don't happen to remember the name of the app, do you? The the app that Daniel used? No, I don't. No. Um, the, it, I was wondering it was if it, it was... It was a City of Edmonton app. Um, oh, okay. It was like, but, you go to the City of Edmonton website and then, and then he... They, I don't know, it's like trails or something. So he, he it, they basically grade the trail. So uh, if it's like a dirt trail, they'll let you know. If it's a uh, hard surface like asphalt or concrete, they'll let you know. Okay. And and so yeah. that's kind of how he how he does. I'm sure it's still, you know, I'm, I'm sure he still finds himself in places where this is just too hard to navigate for him. Um, it just because so many, there's so many different wheelchairs out there, right? And, yeah. and so, yeah. There is well, I know they've been prioritizing certain routes. So, I, yeah, this Ron's right. It's on the City of Edmonton website. I'm not completely familiar with it because I don't have a cell phone because I'm strange. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> for those who do have cell phones, it's pretty easy to find. It's on the City website, and, yeah, you can download the app. And it has the larger trails, right, um, in there, the, you know, the more frequently used ones. And I know the city is trying to, up, you know, eventually update all of them, but that's going to take time. And some of the trails will never be accessible, and that's fine. Um, it's just because of grade change, et cetera, it'd be too expensive to make them fully accessible. But, you know, we're starting to get more and more, uh, starting with, you know, the funicular, right? The funicular was a project that was finished a few years ago. And now somebody can actually wheelchair from downtown, go down the funicular, funicular and get really close to the water, which you couldn't before, you know, in the river. So that's really nice. So in time, we'll get better at doing that. Yeah. If you did have a cell phone, 
you would be able to download an app called Access Now, which I will put a link to on our show notes. And actually, the the person who created this app is somebody that I hope to do a podcast with at some point. She has muscular dystrophy, and she created this app that people can add to. And I know that uh, Julie Sachuk, who is somebody that uh, we're all familiar with, did a map mission day, which was spearheaded by this app, Access Now, just the other day. And she was map missioning her town where she lives. And they did a blitz and went all around to the stores. And it was about how accessible the stores are and whether or not they have accessible washrooms and what the components are of their accessibility. It's it's really quite something. But you're right, Ron, when you say that it really is dependent on the quality of the information that people upload. And whoever creates any app has to be kind of content to have whatever information they have and to have that information be corrected if necessary at some point. Yeah, I just I made the point because I know when I was working in New Zealand, we, there was somebody working on that, but the person was in a wheelchair. So their main focus was obviously that, right? So mm. that's great. But yeah, we have to get others involved as well to make sure that we're not yeah, excluding anybody. Right. And, and I, just to just to comment on kind of the flip side of all of this too, is, you know, I keep thinking, um, I thought maybe I was the the oldest person to not be embracing technology, but maybe maybe Robert's slightly younger than me. <laughs> but um, and so we're, we're kind of dinosaurs in a way, but in a good way. Um, but I, you know, on the flip side, I, I you know, I, 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 I think that until we, um, you know, until we perfect the apps, which I don't think will ever really truly be done. Um, or we, we gain this critical mass of people who understand the complex issues often that relate to creating a more accessible built environment. Um, we still rely on, on uh, key people, um, uh, champions, if you may, who c can really individually make change happen, right? And so, you know, I, I witnessed that growing up with my father becoming a, a city of Edmonton um, politician. He was an activist and advocate for people with disabilities ever since I was born. And so the city of Edmonton has really benefited from one person, one individual who who kind of spearheaded the charge. Of course, there were others involved, but, you know, we really relied on somebody that, that took activism to another level, got involved in the, po the political system, made change happen. He was also a, a provincial MLA for for 12 years. So, you know, I've seen how, how one person can make a real big difference and um, kind of taking it back to our conversations about small towns, it doesn't get any easier or better uh, for an opportunity to do something like that. Uh, you know, the main street of Devon, for example, is what, three or four blocks. Uh, it wouldn't take much for the mayor of Devon to say, you know what, we're going to, we're going to use this as an example to maybe get the province involved, uh, um, the federal government even, to create uh, a great four blocks of, of pedestrian friendly, accessible uh, design with you know proper curb cuts and crosswalks and all the rest. Um, because it is, it is a smaller scale thing, it's actually achievable without a lot of layers of bureaucracy and so on to get done. Um, in a slightly larger way, I've seen it, uh, I've witnessed it in, in the city of Lethbridge, which um, it's got to be more than 100,000 people now, but the last time that I was working there, uh, it was around 100,000 people. And it, the city had a, a couple of champions, actually. One who's since retired, I worked with, he, was, he worked for the city uh, uh, of Lethbridge in the building department. Um, he himself had a disability. He 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 was hard of hearing, and um, but he he was all over accessibility. And so whenever he got involved in a project uh, uh, that they had to do for for their um, for their city owned buildings, he always made sure they had a high degree of accessibility. And I was hired to do uh, an audit of all the city owned buildings, and and got to become quite familiar with Lethbridge and. And the other champion is is uh, is a gentleman who uses a power wheelchair, and he's just 
um, I always would say this about my dad and, and I would say this about Chris is a little bit of a woodpecker on the decision makers brains, right? You just keep, <laughs> you keep bugging them until they finally, you know, do what you want because you'll, you might go away, but, um, they do have a particular street in Lethbridge that's about, you know, six blocks long and the intersections are just so well done with the tactile, uh, truncated domes in the curb cuts, the streets, the, the crossings have, uh, they're lit up when you, when you press the button and, uh, just a really wonderful example within a smaller city of, of what can be done, um, when the, um, when, when people push for it. Right. And I, I couldn't help but think that it could happen in, in a, in a city the size of Lethbridge and, and it would just be so much harder to make it happen in, in Edmonton or Calgary, like, you know, even, even picking the intersection that would best, you know, happen. Maybe Robert, you can talk a little bit about 104th street in the downtown of Edmonton that I think there was some push there to create a, a more accessible, a uh, couple of blocks there. Yeah. Well, 104 is a good example of what I would say, probably not the best, um, solution in the end so describe it to people um, basically it used to be like a regular street with curb and channel and then uh, before I arrived um, I, I can't remember exactly when it was done um, probably I don't know 2010 2012 whatever it was um, and they redesigned the entire street and they basically did rolled curbs so the curbs kind of they're a little bit flat but they're still a curb right a curb edge um and so that's easier for somebody in a wheelchair mobility scooter to get across but it creates a lot of uh, issues for somebody with low vision because they find it difficult to locate this rolled curb because usually they're looking for a hard curb right so you usually get the you know the right angle curb it's easy to identify when you're tapping with your cane when you get a rolled curb it's a little bit harder to distinguish where the sidewalk is and where the street is where the cars are um and um so it's harder for them to figure out where they are um so i would much prefer either you do a uh, a street, redo the street so it's just like a normal street with uh, sidewalks and curbs, um, you know, hard edge curbs, so they're easy to identify. Or you do a shared space, which is basically from building line to building line, it's all flat. And then what we have an example of this um, in Edmonton now, it's just been recently constructed, it's right near City Hall on 10, I'm trying to remember the, is it 103? I always forget the numbers, um, but anyway, the it actually has a um, we call them tactile delineator strips. So what it is, it's a different type of material, um, and it's actually detectable underfoot, so you can feel it. It's 600 millimeters wide minimum, so that people don't step over and miss it, um, and so they could walk along the street. So there's cars and there's lots of there's people, uh, but they can. They're, they're, the tactile delineator strip is designed so it's closer to the building. So people with low vision, they feel more comfortable because they hear the sound bouncing off from the building. They feel more comfortable being there uh, instead of being close to traffic. And and so um, so they uh, can navigate the streets safely. So these are the type of you know things you can do to to make streets really interesting and nice places to be. Um, shared spaces allow for you know sh shops to open up right onto the street. You could close off the street on the weekend and have a market because it's all one level. It's easy. Um, so there's yeah lots of really interesting things you can do with those. Um, with those types of streets, but you have to obviously think of how you're going to make sure you're designing it, particularly as people with low vision, how would they navigate that street, um, which is, uh, it can be done. It has been done in many places. We just need to do a better job of it. Um, yeah, the, the rolled curve example, um, you know, again, this is what I was talking about, how somebody came along and said, okay, from a wheelchair perspective, this is great but it's not necessarily great for other disabilities, right? So we've got to make sure we, we think about others as, as well. Very complex issues. <clears throat> Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and, that, and that's why you, you, you know, you need that expertise too, right? And um, right. I kind of been saying this is that, that there's just, there's not too many people out there with, with the expertise to look at the issues. You know, and sometimes uh, I'm sure Robert, you feel like this too, like you're talking to people um, other planners, decision, your, your, your council, um, 
and you're saying a bunch of stuff and they're kind of nodding their head going, Oh yeah. Okay. And, but do they really understand what you're saying? Right? Like it's, yeah. Yeah. it's, uh, it, it's, it's, um, we find ourselves, I think in a bit of a teaching position where we're yeah. just trying to educate people about things that we're, we're very, very familiar with. Right. And, yeah. um, so we, we have to answer a lot of questions, um, for like engineers and, and again, like I said, politicians, um, to be able to, to get things done. Right. And sometimes we're not included in those discussions yep. and, and, and then that's why you get, you get a, a, a street that's conducive to people who use wheelchairs, but not so much for other disability, for example. Yeah. Exactly. And it's just, I think we, it's kind of going back to what you were talking about, Ron, is the fact that, um, you know, I, I, ever since I've like worked in another country and how they look at um, accessible issues, I think one of the things that still kind of, um, I guess, kind of uh, hits me in Canada is we've decided to go for the accessible term, right? Accessibility is now the term. Uh, if you look at the new Accessible Canada Act that was created a couple of years ago, right? Um, everything's to do with accessibility. And I still think sometimes that that term kind of pigeonholes people and people who don't have uh, any mobility challenges, they think, oh, it's all just for those people. It's not for me. Whereas in other countries, like as you know, Ron, like in Europe and Norway, um, they use universal design. Right. It's this, it's I think it's a, a better way to sell it to the general population, because all of these elements that we've been talking about this this podcast, the previous one are about elements that benefit everybody, not just people with disabilities. Right. And that term universal design, I think, speaks to that um, more eloquently as opposed to accessibility, which unfortunately i you know i think a lot of people think that it's just for those people in, who have you know sight loss or um who are in a wheelchair or a mobility scooter etc um so yeah i th think that's one of the things we need to another thing to add to the pile yeah, uh, yeah. to fight for right it's to show that as i said that's why i think the stats are really important that's you know i quoted those stats earlier stats can recently um sent out their um uh, numbers for people uh, with any kind of uh, disability that's uh, impacted by the built environment. And if you look, Alberta is 26% of the population. All across Canada, it's about 24 to 25%. Um, PEI and other provinces are even higher, somewhere up to 30% of the population. So we're seeing all across the, across the country. And these are statistics from 2022. So if you look back to 2018, Stats Can statistics, Canada was probably about 20% um, that identified that with some disability that's impacted by the built environment. Now we're up to 25, 26%. It's only going to get higher. So, you know, pretty soon we'll be up to 30% of the population. So it could make our jobs a bit easier, right, to argue for these things because now there's more people. Uh, but still, um, it's just shocking to me that we have to have these discussions still with professionals who work in the built environment and see this on a regular basis. I get questioned. Uh, about engineers uh, at work saying, why do we need curb cuts everywhere? <laughs> I don't see people in wheelchairs crossing at this intersection. They're like, are you standing there seven <laughs> days a week, 24 hours a day? Like, come on. So it's just, well, we still have to argue for those things sometimes. It's shocking. You're very right about the words, though, and using inclusive design instead of accessibility. Words matter so much. Uh, I find when I talk to clients about Robert, um, Ron and I have talked about this before. I talk to them about showers and we talk about a barrier free shower, a roll in shower, an accessible shower. As soon as I call it a Euro shower, that's it. They want one because that's the sexy term Euro shower, which doesn't imply that they are somehow different. Yes. Exactly. It was a lovely lady I, I met in Australia when I was there a long time ago I was at a conference, and she works for um, the Victoria government, uh, the state government, and she described uh, how she would de um, develop presentations for developers to encourage them to, to develop um, you know, more accessible um, housing out in suburbia. And so she described it um, really eloquently, and I can send you, a, I think I have a copy of her presentation, but it's just the way she, she showed that you can design the homes uh, right from the out front, outset. Um, so a young couple buys this house, and a lot of the stuff is hidden, 
right? It's behind the walls of the bathroom. Um, there's extra studs put in so that you could add a, a, a grab bar later, right? In, in the shower, like Ron will know all about the stuff. But it's just, it's just having these homes built so that they're easy to adapt when somebody needs them, right? Or if they have, you know, an older relative has to move in with them, they could easily adapt this house without having to move. Um, and, and uh, you know, for very uh, cost-effective uh, way to, to make the house fully accessible. It's, it's incredible. And I can't believe they've been doing this in Australia for over 10 years now in a lot of their new home construction. Um, yeah, we, we have to pick up on some of those, these things as well in Canada. Mm -hmm. Even the concept of the visitable home, which we were talking about earlier, makes so much sense because if it is a two-story house, for instance, and the occupants find that they need to live on one level all of a sudden, it's already done. Mm -hmm. They have to find a room to transform into a bedroom, but essentially that's all they have to do because the washroom is already there. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Terrific. Well, I will ask for final words from each of you. And uh, as we bring this fascinating podcast to a close, uh, Robert, you're the, you're the guest. Would you like to go first? Well, I just wanted to thank you so much, Karen and Ron, for, uh, for this opportunity, um, you know, to, to talk about these things. As you can tell, I'm very passionate about it and I can talk for hours. So if you want to do more part, podcasts, I'm up for it. <laughs> but don't don't hit, say hit. that because we're going to we're going to rope you in. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. But no, I really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I just, any way I, I can get the word out, the more I've been trying to do this is since I, since I, you know, came back to Canada is, is really trying to get people to really think of these things. And it's, for me, it's just pre-planning for me. Cause I know one day I'm going to need all these elements as well. I'm being selfish. I want to get all these things into our streets, into our, our, you know, our neighborhoods, uh, into our homes, um, so that, yeah, our, as we age, as we um, change over time, that, you know, our, we can live uh, that accessible journey. And that's my, um, you know, goal for the country. Hopefully someday we'll get there. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for joining us. I've enjoyed learning from you and hope to learn more in the future. And Ron, any final words from you? Um, yeah, I, I uh, uh, kind of at a um, higher level, I guess, but um, I, I can already think of a uh, future podcast for the three of us. And that would be to um, look uh, overseas at what's happening um, in places like Australia, New Zealand and, and Europe as well and it's certainly certainly something that i've been coming to grips with uh, that's really that does kind of play off of what robert talked about with the language um for far too long i think canada has been influenced by what happens in the states and uh i think we need to uh pay more attention to what's happening uh elsewhere in the world and uh, i'm part of an international group of architects uh, focusing in on issues around uh, social issues, I guess you could say, um, which does involve people with disabilities. Um, and I certainly get a, a much different take from people in Europe, uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand, even South America, the group that I'm a part of. And they do talk about uh, this idea of in being inclusive in a very holistic way. So they do talk about inclusion for people of color, people with different, you know, ethnic backgrounds, people with disabilities. Um, I, f I feel like sometimes here in North America, we get pigeonholed into, uh, even when we say the term universal design, the default ends up being uh, people with disabilities. And so uh, I, I think we, we have to let, <laughs> let the states do what they do and, and uh, be more inspired by what's happening elsewhere um, and, and learn from experts in, in different parts of the world that I think have a, a much better understanding of what, uh, what universal design or inclusive design is, is really all about. And um, I, I do agree with Robert that um, this term accessibility does, does very much talk about about people with disabilities. And I've kind of, within my own profession of architects, I've decided to focus on that issue. So even in the architectural world where we talk about being inclusive, uh, the discussions usually revolve around our First Nations populations, people of color. 
and they forget the fact that inclusion means people with disabilities too in our you know our aging population so i just feel like i'm that person that has to keep reminding people that inclusion is a bigger is a bigger thing than just um uh you know pe- people uh of color first nations even our our, um, our, our, our gay community, you know, so all, all very important. And, and if we think about all of the issues all at the same time, I think we'll, we'll make much better uh, progress. A very positive comment to end our podcast on. So again, my thanks to both of you. And I will thank those of us, those who have been listening to us. Thank you for joining us. And I look forward to seeing all of you again on the next episode of Real Life Renos, the podcast. Thank you.